Hey everyone, my name is Stefan and I'm a 3D character artist and this is a video showing my full process of making a portrait of Seth Everman. If you don't know who he is, he's a YouTube artist whose content I've enjoyed for many years. Sadly, he's announced that he'll be retiring from YouTube this year, so I decided to make this portrait of him as a fun little side project in tribute to him, since as you may know, his content's all about having fun. Now I've worked as a professional character artist for well over a decade now, but more recently at work I've been tasked mainly with like clothing and armor and accessories, that sort of thing. And at the time of recording this, it's actually been years since I've started a head from scratch, so while I know how to do this, I'll be rediscovering some important things as I go along and it's, it's going to take me a little bit of messing around to reach a satisfying result. The whole thing was recorded over the span of about a week for about one hour each day. And what you see right now is day one, so my most out of shape. But I know that I will eventually get there. And I remember the process being kind of the same when I was still a beginner at this. So if you're a beginner, my pro tip would be don't be discouraged if your model looks like trash in the beginning. Because once you already have something, no matter how bad, it's a lot easier to start fixing mistakes. It's all digital, you can go back and fix mistakes at any time. And then once you're better at anatomy or not terribly out of practice like me here, this process is going to be much faster with fewer initial mistakes, but it's the same process, no matter your skill level. So right now I'm using just the most standard brushes, the clay build up, move, Damien standard pinch, pretty much the most basic tools which you get with stock ZBrush and Blender. You can see I have a custom interface which allows for better efficiency. I can share my setup if you're interested, just let me know in the comments. So here I use clay polish, which is a really nice tool for quickly cleaning up your model from messy brush strokes. It's great for stylized work, but also for initial blocking out of forms for a more realistic model like this one. And now I'm just continuing to refine parts one by one. I'm not really committing too much though, since I know I'll be swapping out this mesh for one with nicer topology later on. Modeling from a sphere can be a fun exercise, but if you want really good results, I recommend always working off of a base mesh with nice topology. A lot of people don't realize this, but topology is actually quite important. Even when sculpting, it really makes the difference between the mesh working for you rather than against you when you're working on it. And yes, of course, you can get really great final results starting from a sphere as well, but it's just going to be a much bigger hassle getting there rather than starting from a base mesh. So I'm trying to get a really rough likeness at this point, just doing some refinements, but nothing really, really fine yet. I'm also not going to break symmetry yet, even though that's pretty important for a good likeness. That'll be something to do once there's a nicer topology on this mesh. Here you can see I'm making use of spotlight and the reference images I have loaded up. Doing my best to match the perspective of the viewport with the perspective of the reference images. So whenever I'm doing someone's likeness, I find it really, really helpful to take turns between keeping your reference images to the side and just observing them, trying to match them that way, and then lining them up with your model and trying to match it that way. It really, really helps in my opinion, rather than just doing one or the other. They can both be very misleading if you're sticking just to one method. So yeah, I'm not thrilled with how this is looking just yet. But I reiterate, this is all part of the process. The longer you look at your model, the easier it's going to become to find mistakes and fix them. It doesn't matter how long this stage takes. What matters is the end result. So I know I shouldn't be afraid of making a mistake and breaking the flow of my work, but rather keep at it and let happy little accidents happen. It's not like we can't fix anything later on. Even after the model is 100% finished, you can still tweak proportions and things. And this is a model made for fun, so I'm not stressing out over it. So here I finally imported a better base mesh, which is just one of the heads I've made in the past, just reshaped to match the sculpt we have right now. And of course, as I'm projecting the old sculpt onto this new base mesh, that's going to introduce some new jankiness that wasn't there before, but that's okay, that's easy enough to fix. And it's going to be a lot easier to fix because the topology is now on our side. It's not going to fix this terrible likeness though. That's going to take some more messing around on my part. So you can see the eyes are a little bit far apart and I'm fixing that now. I moved them out earlier when I was trying to line up the model with the reference. That was obviously a mistake, but it does demonstrate how you can be misled when using that technique. It's because the perspective will never quite match, so things like this will happen. But then you can fix them once the reference is out of the way and you're using your brain again to observe. 
Some of the changes made with the reference overlay were good, just not that one. And now that it's fixed, we're a step closer to a better likeness. You could achieve this faster, but I'm showing my whole meandering process for the sake of showing the process. Because my goal is for this to be useful to you. And if it is, please let me know. I'd be very, very happy to know. So anyway, you may have noticed earlier I created a polygroup for the lower jaw and one for the interior of the mouth. And now I'm creating one for the upper head and then another one just for the upper eyelids. This is another great perk of having nice topology. You can quickly select and group or mask such areas so that you can work with more precision and not affect areas you don't want. It just makes the whole thing easier, especially here where you have the skin folding over the upper eyelid. You can just mask the upper eyelid and work on the other part safely without ruining anything. So here I'm starting to apply some really rough base colors along with a better skin material to help visualize the end result. This also helps immensely in spotting any mistakes in the likeness, especially when we add the eyebrows which are so characteristic to Seth's face. At least I feel like as soon as I've painted them on, he looks a lot less like Dollar Store Voldemort and a lot more like Seth Everin. Even just adding the color of the scalp helps a lot. And now's a good time to break symmetry and go more in depth for that likeness. We can more clearly tell the mouth needed to go up a bit, the nose a bit to the left, and those eyebrows sticking out, oh my god, I promise I fix them later. So anyway, the eyes shouldn't be perfectly level, so let's fix that. And then just fixing various proportions below the head that I've been neglecting earlier. So now we're back to just observing and gradually refining any noticeable discrepancies with the reference images. Just in a little bit more detail now. I'm not really going into the anatomy in detail because this is pretty sped up. But if you'd like to see more anatomy focused content, do let me know in the comments. This is my first video, but I'm pretty excited to record and share a lot more stuff in the future. So anyway, here I'm finally fixing those ridiculous eyebrows. Sometimes in your reference that ridge would look like it's bigger than it really is because of the volume of the eyebrows themselves, but this was inexcusable. <laughs> it looked terrible. I'm glad I didn't take too long to take care of it. Finally giving a little bit more attention to the profile of the nose as well. And then just the same process as before. Observing and tweaking, I find it pretty therapeutic. You can see we're still at a very low subdivision level. I think it's much better to keep it low for as long as possible. It just helps you to be a lot cleaner when you're still making relatively broad proportion changes to your model. Now back to the nose. The bottom of it I've completely neglected until now. Knowing the anatomy comes in really handy at this stage. When doing smaller things like this, I may not even be looking at the reference the entire time because I already know how a nostril is constructed for example, or how the eyelids wrap around the eyeball and such things. And obviously, most smaller superficial details aren't super characteristic to a face, especially a young face. So I think it's okay to do them in a more generic textbook way. And this is still something I'm doing for fun, so I'm not gonna stress out too much about super tiny details. I did some slight refinement of the colors. Like I said, they really help achieve a better likeness, so it's a good idea not to neglect them and still improve them wherever you see they need some improvement. It may seem obvious to you, but I've seen a lot of people struggling to do a likeness staying in just the default grey clay material. And then as soon as you add some color you go, oof, that looks bad. I'm not saying it's wrong or it's impossible to do it without color. Obviously on a good model you can always still tell it's a really good model, even if you're looking at it with no color information, and you'll still immediately recognize who it is. For example, when I was making this portrait of Jeremy Irons, I didn't use any color. I probably should have. What I am saying is it can help a lot. So why not use it? Especially if you're at a stage where you can use all the help you can get. There's no shame in that. And if you need to, you can always occasionally switch off the color information if it's getting in the way. Like here, when I just want to work on the silhouette of the nose. I know this was a really long tangent, but this is information that I wish someone would have told me when I was still learning. So I hope it's useful to some other aspiring artist. And I'm not the only idiot. So here I'm finally adding some definition to the ears as well. It's an area that's very often completely neglected. This may be obvious, but ears are actually pretty specific to each person. So if you're going for a likeness, having images of that specific person's ears is pretty nice. But unfortunately I don't have any images of Seth's ears. So again, I'm just using generic textbook reference. 
The ears are actually another area where good topology comes extremely handy. If you have the correct edge flow, everything just seems to want to go where it should, which feels great, I gotta say. And now the back of the ears. Usually on most characters, nobody would see this because of hair, but um, yeah. So yeah, same old process again. I'd love to go more into the anatomy, but that'd mean I'd have to talk at like 50 words a second at this speed. So that'll be another video. So I'm making the neck a little bit shorter. I'm not entirely sure if that was the right call as I'm just eyeballing it. And it's worth considering that Seth is apparently a very tall man. But I'm not too concerned about this because it's not going to be too visible once we put a hoodie on him. Let's adjust the lower jaw a little bit and the lower eyelid some more. They're very characteristic to his face. And you'll notice I'm not going for an entirely neutral expression like you see on the left or on the upper right. But rather I'm giving him a little bit of that signature scowl of his. I think that's his most recognizable expression. And here we are finally at the detailing stage where I'll add skin pores and tiny wrinkles and that sort of thing. So for that I've subdivided the mesh a few more times. And right now we're at 4 million polygons. For this stage it's really useful to use a morph target and layers. That way it's really easy to control the depth of your detail at any point in time. And also to clean up and redo any parts you're not too happy with. And the other really important thing is to use appropriate alphas for different points on the face. Because there's really a lot of variety across any face in terms of bumps and wrinkles and pores and stretchiness. Here I'm using a free set of brushes by a fantastic artist called Rafael Souza. I highly recommend you go out and get it because there's really no reason not to have it. It's a great set. So to go on another tangent here, I know how popular blenders become for sculpting. And for me, even though Blender is now my daily driver 3D software package, I've still not gotten into its sculpting features at all. It's on my to-do list, but I keep postponing it because I expect I'll find it's really not on par with ZBrush yet. I haven't tested it out for myself yet, but it's what I keep reading online. Is it time I try it out? Let me know what you think, really, I want to know. As far as I know, Blender can't really handle really high amounts of geometry when sculpting. On this model I mentioned that we're at 4 million polys right now and I could easily subdivide it again to 16 with zero issues. And this is on my secondary PC that has a Ryzen 5600 which is a CPU you can get for like 130 euros now. And ZBrush barely uses the GPU at all so you could literally use it professionally on the cheapest potato hardware with integrated graphics which I think is a huge plus. I do also love Blender though, like I said earlier, it's my primary 3D software package now and I couldn't live without it. Anyway, I know this was a rather long tangent, but here I am pretty much doing a, the same thing as earlier. I did promise I was gonna show the entire process so I didn't want to cut too much out. Now we're just doing some final tweaks and adjustments. And this is just about it for the zebra stage. You can see we still have really basic color, but next step is texturing. And baking it is pretty straightforward, it's just a single mesh. I don't care about the eyes, we're gonna swap them out later. I did bake it on the second subdivision level, just so it's a bit higher res, I'm not gonna be rigging or animating it or anything. So I'll be texturing him by hand, this is a pretty standard process which I'll briefly go over. You can see we started with a base layer of just skin color and then one by one we'll be adding layers of different color variations. You can see I'm painting some noisy mask wherever I want each layer to show through. First one's red because it's the most prominent. Then next we add blue and do the same process pretty much. Add a base noise texture and then just do some painting on top of that. I'm mostly following a guide like this for where the skin tone variation is supposed to go. So next up it's a greenish yellow kind of color. Here I'm using it mostly to complement the blue color in the lower jaw area. Next one is brown which is like a UV damage layer. I give it like a freckly base noise texture and then I just paint through wherever I want it to show. They're more visible on some faces than others, here they're pretty subtle. So next up I add purple, I use this mostly around the eyes. It's a bit too strong in the beginning but then I just dial it back. And this is a great way of working with layers, you can paint and then you can just 
tweak each layer's mask or its color wherever you need, adding two masks here, taking away there. And now I'm adding an ambient occlusion layer for some subtle self-shadowing and I like to give it a little bit more of a red tint so it looks more natural. Now I'm adding some more of that bluish purple color variation on his scalp. Not a lot of blood vessels visible through that thicker scalp skin and hair follicles. Next up I add the cavity layer. This is gonna be pretty subtle. I mostly use it more for the roughness map, not so much in the color. And I know he looks kinda weird without any eyebrows. I should have really painted those earlier. I forgot to hit record when I did, but they're really easy to paint with this hairlines brush which comes standard with Substance Painter. The whole thing took like a few minutes. And we aren't going too detailed because this is just a base for actual hairs which are going to go on top of the texture. And it's mostly going to be hidden underneath. So like before, now that we have our base, I'm just gonna continue refining what we already have. Defining the mask of the scalp a little bit more. It's pretty sharp actually, looking at reference. Now I'm just adding some color correction layers. The overall skin tone was a little bit too light and desaturated. And we can color correct it inside Blender as well, but it's nice to have it as close as possible here in Substance Painter. And right now that color correction layer is temporarily switched off so I can do some painting on the moles, which is the layer underneath. There's a lot of really tiny ones which are kind of difficult to see on the reference I have, but it's okay if this isn't 100% super accurate. And now the color correction is back on, so I can continue to do some final tweaks. You can see at the end, each layer's contribution is pretty subtle, but combined together they add much more of a sense of complexity to the texture. And now that I'm happy with the color, I move on to the subsurface scattering map, which is the simplest one of the utility maps we're gonna use. It kind of depends on where you're gonna be rendering and I'll tweak it later for Blender's EV if necessary. So next one is going to be the roughness map. With this one I like to start out with the ambient occlusion map which I adjust so it's not as high contrast. And then I add the cavity detail like I mentioned earlier. It may not help too much for the color but it really helps a lot for the roughness map. And then after that I paint in some shinier areas, like the eyelids, the tip of the nose, the lips. And you can see I'm switching occasionally to see what the actual roughness map looks like. I love how intuitive Substance is and that you can quickly switch to see your utility maps. So you can see that there's a little bit more painting involved for the roughness map, but it's still nothing too complex. Just a couple of base layers and then some noisy painting. Here you can see I've also added a layer for less shiny areas like the lower jaw. And then I just continue to paint inside the mask of each one. I want the eyebrows to be less shiny because there's going to be hair on top like I mentioned. And that's about it for the roughness as well and the texturing stage as a whole. Next up I jump into Marvelous Designer to very quickly make a hoodie because Seth Everman is always wearing a hoodie. I'm actually doing barely anything here because I'm using one of the preset hoodies that come with Marvelous Designer. And if you didn't know about them, they're really nice as a starting point for most types of garments you may need to make. But here we're making just a completely standard hoodie so I'm really not altering the preset. Just adding some seam taping at the edge of the hood so it's a little bit more rigid. And then just increasing the density and exporting. Now back inside ZBrush to make it the correct size and do some slight detailing work. Also move the arms a little bit further down in a more natural standing position. And I remeshed each of the parts using Z Remesher while retaining each of the parts groups. The separated groups are gonna give us some really nice seams once we add some thickness. You can see I'm using panel loops to just extrude each of the pieces out. And then adding a little bit of inflation to make them look softer. I do the same thing with the torso area as well. And you can see that once we inflate it and smooth it out a bit, we get these really nice soft seams, which are exactly where they need to be, no sculpting required. And this is a relatively dense mesh, but we are going to just be making a still image, so that's okay. If I were making like a low poly model, I'd need to retopologize this. And after some final fit adjustments, I think that's looking pretty good. And just to take it a step further, I like to use alpha stamps to give it some micro wrinkles as well. I feel it adds a lot of believability to any garment, even though it's a relatively subtle effect. In my opinion, it's really worth the extra effort. 
So after that, I added the little loopholes for the strings that go through the rim of the hood. Not much to say about this, you can see it's pretty simple stuff. I'm just sculpting a little bit of folding around them. And then adding the strings themselves using curves. Because they're resting on his chest, it's really useful to use continuous Z projection. And after some final tweaks, I start unwrapping some UVs. Which are going to be very useful once we're inside Blender and want to add some nicer material to it. And it's very quick and easy to unwrap it inside ZBrush using UV Master. That's why I'm doing it inside here rather than in Blender. And now that that's done, we can finally bring everything into Blender. It's really satisfying loading up assets which you've already completed. So I'm just loading up the textures we made in Substance earlier and setting up a basic material for the hoodie. And now we're just making some lights. And with the basic light setup done, I got rid of these proxy eyes, which were only there for preview purposes, and swapped them out with these really nice ones, which I've made years ago. So sorry for not covering the process, but do let me know if you're interested in seeing how they're made in some other video. Next up, I made the eyebrows using Blender's new hair system. I did initially try to make them with the old hair system, but I'm not very experienced with that, so that didn't turn out too well. I'm quite happy with the new system though, and while it has some things still missing, it's really nice and usable already. And since they added these new modifiers in the Asset Browser, it's been fantastic. I'm still afraid of geometry nodes, so anything to keep me away from them is nice. So you saw I started out with just a few strands to guide the overall shape of the eyebrow, and now I'm using the density brush to really populate the area with hairs, and then tweaking with the comb brush, sometimes masking the ends or roots of the hairs. I also like to mask everything and then just add some new hairs which I can then more easily comb without affecting the rest. And that's pretty much the whole process. I'm using the standard shader here instead of the principled hair shader because I'm going to be keeping it in Eevee. And at the end I just added these extra hairs at the very edges of the eyebrows. Then I take the whole thing, mirror it and place it roughly where it needs to go. And then in the top menu go curve, snap to near surface. Very useful for things like this. After that I can use the slide brush to place it exactly where it needs to be. And then just comb or regrow some hairs wherever I want them to be different from the other side. And that's it for the eyebrows. Then I moved on to the eyelashes. I started out with a separated base mesh, but that's really not necessary for a mesh that's not that heavy. If this were a mesh with millions of polygons, we would really be seeing a lot of lag working on the hair. So you can see the process is pretty much the same as with the eyebrows. I added a bunch of base hair strands, combed them so they're in the correct position and then just added some more strands in between. Except for the eyelashes, I'm using the add brush to add single lashes instead of the density brush. Because I don't want it to cover an area, I want it to just go in a straight line more or less. And then just some subtle clumping using the standard modifier. And the process is pretty much exactly the same for the eyelashes of the lower lid. There's far fewer of them than on the upper lid, of course. And they're also a lot shorter, and they cover less of the eyelid. I did make them a lot longer than they need to be initially, and then just shrink them down to the size they should be. After that, I duplicated the eyelashes to the opposite side, and that was that. Next up, I made a tear line. This was done with geometry, I just duplicated some faces. Then extruded them so they cover up just the bottom of the visible part of the eyeball. This is another subtle little detail which doesn't take a lot of work, but I think it adds a lot of realism. So I just unwrap some nice straight UVs for it. And that way I can map it to a gradient ramp, which will help me hide the harsh edges. And then because I couldn't figure out how to map the gradient horizontally like an idiot, I just rotated the UVs 90 degrees. Then I add some noisy bumpiness so it's not perfectly flat. And we have our tier line. Now it's just a question of doing the same thing for the opposite. This is probably a bit more effort than I'd put into most professional projects, simply because most clients wouldn't care that much. But I do want this portrait to do justice to Seth Everman. Seth, if you're watching this by any chance, first of all, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. But secondly, if you'd like to have this model, feel free to get in touch and let me know. I'd be thrilled for you to have it. Anyway, back to this. You can see I'm tweaking the gradient we mapped earlier. And you can see the end result is this tiny sliver of tear liquid. Totally worth it. Now I jump back to ZBrush real quick to make a tear duct. 
Nothing exciting about that, just sculpting a sphere and then using Z remesher in the end to give it some nice topology. I didn't go so far as to texture him because I felt that that was a lot of work for relatively little benefit. A nice material setup would do just fine here. You can see I only painted in some transparency to help the tear duct blend with the eyeball. Next up is the hoodie material. I started with a weave texture which is just really densely tiled. On a black hoodie like this that's barely going to be visible but it's there. That tiny bit of color variation is still nice to have. And I hope you can also notice the tiny wrinkles we added to the seams earlier. Next up I added a little bit of fuzz just to make the fabric look softer and more natural. Like I mentioned earlier, I don't really know what I'm doing whenever I'm using the older hair system. But playing around with the settings I was able to get a decent looking result. What really made it look good I think was adding some alpha transparency to the material. After that I just copied the same particle system to the torso as well. I'm just adding the ends of the strings of the hoodie, which you can see is a very complicated modeling task. Then I unwrapped the strings themselves and gave them a little bit of a larger weave. I'm using a variation of the same material I used on the hoodie, and I think that should be pretty much it for the whole portrait. I'm just kidding, I know this is it because I recorded it like a week ago. I hope you enjoyed this, let me know, and please subscribe and all the other stuff YouTubers say.